Hello and welcome to the next video. This one is going to be on iron selective electrodes. And the reading list is exactly the same as it was before. The simplest form of an indicator electrode consists of a piece of wire dipped in an electrolyte. The counter electrode is a reference electrode, so its potential is fixed. In the example shown, the metal is silver and a solution of silver ions. With the circuit completed, the potential difference causes a small current to flow. Electrons travel to the indicator electrode and reduce free silver ions which are deposited on the surface of the solid silver. Considering the half cell reaction for this process, we can derive a Nernst equation relating the half cell potential to the reaction quotient. And we could plug into that values for silver solid and the concentration of silver ions. So we know the standard electrode potential for this reaction. We know that silver is a solid in, in its elemental state as a concentration of one, leaving the only unknown as the reciprocal concentration of silver ions. The reference electrode, the standard Kalman electrode, has a potential of 0.241. This is the potential of the whole left half cell, not just the standard potential for the mercury mercury chloride reaction. This then completes a Nernst equation where the only unknown is the concentration of silver ions, and we can relate that then to the overall cell potential as a means of finding the concentration of silver ions in solution. It's also possible to use other metals as indicator electrodes for their own ions. This works with gold, copper, zinc, cadmium and mercury electrodes. However, most metals, due to sluggish surface kinetics, don't readily establish an equilibrium and such electrodes are not useful. So for most species, a different type of electrode is required. Often we want to analyse the activity of a particular ion in a mixture from a source which contains a variety of different ions. Ions that don't undergo an obvious reduction or oxidation at equilibrium at the metal surface can be identified using an ion selective membrane. The ion selective membrane can also be used to differentiate between different ions in mixtures. The membrane is situated between two reference electrodes with constant potentials. The analyte ion permeates through the membrane, creating a small potential difference proportional to its activity in the analyte solution. Other ions are rejected by the membrane and don't influence the cell potential. The membrane contains a ligand which readily and preferentially complexes the analyte ion. The example of a ligand shown here is vanillomycin, a ring-shaped molecule with inwardly directed oxygen atoms that complex potassium. The matrix in which the ligand is suspended is usually a hydrophobic polymer which rejects both water and water-soluble counterions. In the membrane, to maintain charge balance, when the metal ion enters, there is a hydrophobic counterion which, despite its charge, does not dissolve in water, preferring to remain in the polymer. In this example, it's tetraphenyl boron. On the other side of the membrane is a mixed concentration solution of potassium with some water-soluble counterion, for example, chloride. The concentration of the inner solution is significantly higher than in the analyte solution, so it does not change significantly when potassium crosses the membrane into it. So without wanting to misrepresent the structure of the membrane, obviously a membrane would contain a large number of vanillomycin and a large number of triphenyl boron ions. What I am demonstrating here is the mechanism by which ions can enter into the membrane and also what causes the potential difference to develop. So here, I've shown a magnesium ion being rejected by the membrane. It's a poor fit with the vanillin, so it doesn't find its way into the membrane and it doesn't permeate through to the other side. 
but what will happen is potassium will readily permeate into the membrane and be complexed by the vanilla mycin where there's a triphenyl boron counter ion to balance out that charge. Now you'll get a delta G from the change in solvation of the potassium ion and you'll get a delta G from the change in concentration. Obviously delta G is always proportional to a change in potential difference. So the potassium is complexed by the ligand. We get the two delta G's and we get a further delta G due to the charge imbalance caused by removing the potassium from the analyte solution and the buildup of chloride ions. Delta G for the transfer of potassium to the membrane from solution is the difference of the change in solvation energy and the change in free energy due to the change in activity. Delta G due to the change in activity is in turn proportional to the natural log of the ratio of bound and free potassium. Delta G due to the charge imbalance is proportional to the product of the potential difference caused by the charge imbalance and the number of charges passed. At equilibrium, there is no net change in free energy, so the sum of all three delta Gs is zero. So by rearranging this equation, we can get E outer, the electric potential difference across the phase boundary, and relate it to the concentration of bound and unbound potassium and delta G solvation. E inner is a reference electrode and a solution of fixed concentration. The tiny amounts of potassium that do cross the membrane will not change the concentration sufficiently to change the reference potential. So this value is considered constant. If we subtract this from our expression for E outer, we can calculate the overall cell potential. AM, the activity of potassium within the membrane, is also relatively constant. What we want to get on its own is AO, the activity of potassium in solution. Remember that the natural log of X over Y is natural log of X minus the natural log of Y. So all the other terms apart from RT over NF, natural log of A naught are constants. And we can add these together. So we would get a straight line plot of the potential difference of the cell against the natural log of A naught. And of course we could use such a plot to work out the constant value from the crossing point of the y-axis and then work out the gradient of the line to give us a relationship between the potential difference and the natural log of a naught. So to make this relationship even easier to handle we convert the natural log into log to the base 10. We simply multiply, multiply through by a factor of 2.303 and we derive straight line equation between the electric potential difference for the ion selective electrode against the concentration of potassium in the outer solution. The most commonly used selective electrode is the pH electrode. They are particularly selective, they don't contaminate easily and they do not consume any species. The analyte solution could be a variety of aqueous solutions. The glass bulb acts as a selective membrane and as with the previous example the potential difference measured depends on non-faradaic processes between the two reference electrodes usually a silver or a silver chloride electrode the solution within the right hand electrode is a solution of 0.1 molar hcl saturated with potassium chloride for ease of use, the electrode is engineered so one electrode compartment is wrapped around the other. Here is a more detailed diagram of this kind of device from Harris for you to study at your own leisure. 
So the glass membrane is composed of porous semi-crystalline silica. This is silica with quite a lot of free volume or holes in it. This contains free oxygen bonds, free dangling oxygens, which can complex sodium ions. Now, if we dip the glass into an aqueous solution, like so, the water seeps into the porous structure a very small distance, and a hydrated gel layer is formed. The protons from in the solution permeate into this gel layer where there are a number of free sodium ions with which exchange takes place and this has an associated change in free energy and creates a potential difference. Now of course referring back to one of our previous slides one side of the glass electrode has been fixed at a constant H plus concentration. Here you can see the inner solution is at an activity of 0.1 molar. So placing the probe into solution will only change on the outer surface of the glass, which will establish a potential difference between the inner and outer solutions. The slow movement of sodium ions through the glass permits a current to flow. Now the line diagram for a glass pH electrode looks like this. Now it may look fairly complicated, but every element in it is either constant or has been set at unity apart from the H plus activity of the outer solution or the analyte. As when we were deriving an equation for the selective membrane electrode, the constants now can all be collected and the meter reading is now proportional to the proton activity in the outer solution. It's important to note that we're measuring activity and not concentration. To correct for concentration, we multiply through by a factor, beta, the electromotive efficiency, which we obtain by calibrating the electrode. So to calibrate the electrode, we measure the potential of two solutions of known pH. Ideally, these solutions will be on either side of the pH of the unknown. Then we plot the recorded potential against the known pH of these two standard buffers to obtain a calibration line. The slope of this line will then give us a relationship between pH and potential, and we can use it to find out beta, the electromotive efficiency. So now taking our potential reading, we can read that off on the graph and correlate it to the pH of the solution. Alternatively, we can just use the values ES1 and ES2 over PHS2 and PH1 to get a ratio and then put the unknown potential and the unknown pH into the equation to calculate one from the other. A final variation on the ion selective electrode. That's not to say that's all the types of uh, ion selective electrode, but this is the last one I'm going to talk about. Uh, it employs a solid crystal as the selective barrier. The crystal will be an inorganic salt of some type with defects into which the analyte can permeate. Here is shown a lanthanum 3 plus fluoride crystal doped with europium 2 plus because the europium is satisfied by one less unit of charge than the lanthanum. This creates a void space or vacancy next to it. The internal reference electrode in the solid state electrode will be placed into the analyte containing fluoride ions opposite another reference electrode with a different potential. The potential difference between the electrodes will cause a small flow of fluoride ions from solution across the crystal into the filling solution. 
As all other potentials are fixed, we can derive an equation to relate the pH response. As all other potentials are fixed, we can derive an equation to relate the potential response to fluoride ion activity in the same way we did for the pH electrode. All the constants can be collected, leaving a proportional relationship between the logarithm of the product of fluoride ion concentration and the activity constant. We can separate the activity constant from the concentration of F, remembering log x over y is log x minus log y. And the activity constant of fluoride is kept constant by diluting the analyte solution in a buffer solution of high ionic strength. And this term can then also be collected as a constant. Thus, we have a linear relationship between log fluoride concentration and potential. By plotting for standard solutions of known fluoride concentration, we can determine the constants and the slope of the line to relate the potentiometer reading to the fluoride ion concentration in an unknown. The plot here shows that the voltage response stays linear of almost five orders of magnitude concentration. Finally, here's a nice worked example where you can practice what you've learned about ion selective electrodes. Specifically here, it's the fluoride electrode, but it, it applies equally to any of the ones we've talked about. And I'll give you the solution to this in the class. Thanks very much.